going and hang tight. We'll get your intro going. You've now tuned in to the Drawing Board Podcast, a powerful, thought provoking discussion where we talk about family, relationships, ministry, community, and career. Let's see what exciting guests we have on our show today. What's the good news? This is Andre Ebron, the founder and the host of the Drawing Board Podcast, where we talk about family, relationships, ministry, community, and career. And tonight on the show, I have a very special guest. Our topic for this evening is, Is Education the Great Equalizer? And she has over two decades of investing, and with an affirmative yes, education can be and is a great equalizer. But Patrice M. Neal, is the development director for the Michigan office of UNCF. She has been with UNCF for over 20 years and is responsible for raising 1.5 million, that's with an M, in unrestricted and restricted support through special events, workplace initiatives, campaigns for emergency student aid, and scholarship initiatives. Welcome to the show, Patrice. Thank you, Andre. I'm glad I'm here. Absolutely. Well, I'm glad to have you here. And you have something coming up here on the 24th, this Walk for Education. But before we talk about that, I would love for the listeners to get a chance to know you personally. So you are Detroit born and raised. Born and raised. Okay, so for all my people that are, you know, homebred, throwing up the old English D, (laughs) Patrice is definitely from the D, specifically. The east side. The east side. Proud of it. Well, I heard that you cannot spell the West without the E-S. <laughs> you, you might want to let them know again. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> absolutely. So, from the east side of Detroit. And where, where did you go to school? I went to, oh, let's start. Uh, elementary school was Guyton. So, okay. we, we were way east. Guyton okay. Elementary. Uh, then I went to Remus Robinson for a stint. Then I went to Columbus Middle School and graduated from Denby High School. Okay. All east. All East. Yes. All right. So a proud product of DPS. Proud. All right. So now you transition from DPS. Now you go into the workforce. Mm -hmm. All right. And walk me through that journey as a professional. What were your original, like, dreams, aspirations, goals? You know, it's interesting. Uh, I thought that I would end up being, as a child, a fashion designer. All right. Go figure. I could hear my mother laughing now. Um, And then as I got older, I was like, oh, you know what? I want to be an attorney. Okay. And then I realized how much reading I had to do. All right. And so uh, life had different plans for me. I uh, was then tossed into, okay, what do I want to do? So, you know, the typical uh, college student, you decide you're going to take general electives until you figure out your life. Right. And that ended up being uh, turning into management. So I did... I actually worked for one of the health systems as a secretary. And after being in office co-op throughout high school, I loved the office atmosphere. So I did that for a while. And then one day I decided I don't like traditional corporate America. Okay. I was what they consider millennials now. Right. A disruptor. Right. Right. And so, you know, I was living with my mom. I had a car note. I quit my job okay. and decided I needed a three-month vacation. I was about 24 years old. And one day I woke up, kind of probably because my mom and my stepdad said, you might want to. It's time yeah. to produce. And yeah, so yeah. I mm-hmm. went to a temp agency okay, and ended up working as a receptionist for the United Negro College Fund. Wow. And so it was very fascinating because... You know, the traditional Lou Rawls parade of stars. You know, you didn't hear about UNCF, at least I didn't. Right. Until I got this opportunity. And so it went from temping as a receptionist to here we are over 20 years later. 20 years later. I had the opportunity to progress from a temp to working full time as an administrative assistant. Mm -hmm. Um, And then ultimately the job became my passion and worked my way up. And now I'm the director. And so it's, yeah, never thought of, who knew that this is what I would be doing later on. But, yeah, 20 years later, here I am. So this is almost like the epitome of the drawing board, right? So (laughs) 
the drawing board, it, it is one of those, it's a thought-provoking testimonial, such as yours, mm -hmm. that challenges those who are listening to you to examine their life and then to reimagine the possibilities. Okay. So you go from a three-month hiatus yes. that you decided to take with I the was, cardinal, right? I was tired. Yeah, you were tired, <laughs> right? Just, you know, I'm, I'm going to take a three-month vacation, Just, right? Yeah. And then you go into a temp agency, and what was initially temporary you are now the director yes. over the same program where you were the secretary. Exactly. There are man, there are so many principles within there, but one that I'd like to highlight for our listeners tonight, let's talk about commitment. So, like, what role did commitment play over these 20 years with you being with UNCF? As commitment, um, for me, I don't – I never put my name on anything that I don't value. And so for me to say – you know, this UNCF thing, it piqued my interest. And then I saw the lifelong impact it had on the students and the parents, even though I was answering the phone. I decided, you know what, this is something I can commit to. And as I shared with you, this went from being a job to pay my bills to being ministry. All right. And so for me, it's my... It's my desire and my goal is to leave a legacy at UNCF that would ultimately say, someone would look back and say, after I'm gone 20 years from now from the organization, right. or possibly the CEO of the organization, let's just hey, listen. You know, you who know, knows? Hey, speak, um, but, speak life. Go ahead. Declare so, something. So, you know, so I want them to say, you know, that program, Patrice Neal started that. That has changed so many lives. That has uh, afforded many opportunities to so many underserved and underrepresented students. And so for me, the commitment is I'm going to make sure that I follow through with what I've set. I'm going to make sure that I do what it is that I need to do to, to, to raise the money, to get the message out, to let people know that UNCF is here in Michigan and we're making a difference. Absolutely. Now, I want you to differentiate for the listener. You said it went from being a job to a mm -hmm. ministry. Where's the defining line there? When I woke up one day and decided I have to do this, it was a thing of not a choice. Okay. Um, ministry to me is when you're, you're, you're compelled to do what you need to do, regardless to how you feel, regardless to the pay. Hello, somebody. Absolutely. Regardless regardless to that, you're compelled. I, 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 I dream about stuff, uh, and I count that as part of the ministry where there are thoughts and ideas that have yet to be birthed, and that, that right there lets me know this is not just a job. I, could, I did the job. I went in, I checked off everything I'm supposed to do. Mm -hmm. I clocked out at 5 o'clock, and I went home. Um, but when, not so much the work, but the, the weight of the mission started going home with me, and I found myself sharing with people outside of work, then I knew, okay, now this is about ministry. This isn't about a job. And, again, when you, go so, you work somewhere, uh, as long as I have, and you don't necessarily count the the cost of what you're making versus what you're doing that's good you know that's good. you 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 began to say this is a oh i can help one student um and i would i want to share a story if i can absolutely um i remember i was still an administrative assistant and back in the day we did a mayor scholarship ball and so we awarded students with scholarships. I think it was $10,000 to five students okay. um, each. And there was this one young man. And I remember as an administrative assistant how that pierced my spirit so strongly. Mm -hmm. His mother was ill. He was from the west side of Detroit. He was a brilliant young man. Majoring in, he wanted to go into engineering at Tuskegee. All right. And he did that. And I remember he, he was so willing to volunteer. He wanted to speak and let people, you know, know his story. We used him a lot in different, at different events. And he asked me to take him home one day. I dropped him off after an event. And the, the, the impact of seeing his home, I'll never forget he was, he was living so far below the poverty line that his mother grew a garden in their front yard, fenced in. I mean, she had every vegetable you can imagine because that's how they ate. 
It wasn't going to the grocery store, you know, and grabbing some some corn and some tomatoes. It was go to the front yard. And I'll never forget that young man because he later on went to graduate from Tuskegee University as an engineer. Awesome. You know, so that that I still have a picture of him to this day. Mm -hmm. And so that story has always stayed with me. And it's and so I think about him a lot and I think about, wow, what if UNCF didn't exist? Where would he really have ended up? Or would he have ever finished school? Would he have ever gotten into school? And the people he met along the way that he wouldn't have met otherwise, they were executives and CEOs because of the interaction and the networking. So that right there, that's always going to be my motivator. You said something that I felt was extremely powerful when you were articulating <clears throat> the difference between a job and a ministry. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to, I got to go ahead and quote this directly. You said, when the weight of the mission follows you home, mm -hmm. that's when you know it's something that you're compelled to do. Yep. You have to do it. Have that's to. when you know it's no longer a job, mm -hmm. but it has become a ministry. Yeah. So you all put that in the comments. When the weight of the mission follows you home, Patrice says she dreamt about it, yeah. you know, had creative ideas, witty inventions, things that you were thinking of how to better serve you know, a demographic that was underserved, underrepresented. Mm -hmm. And what I love, though, about your story, because what I, I'm gleaning from it, is that even though she may have been, because there are a lot of families that are 30% below the poverty line, and that affords them the opportunity for certain resources. Exactly. But this parent decided that they were going to use their natural skills to cultivate mm -hmm. a garden. And for me, it's so symbolic of the way that she was raising her son. Yeah is that the garden that she grew in her front yard is the same garden she was tending to in his life. So while he was underrepresented, underserved, he was willing to serve. That's right. He was willing to speak out. Mm -hmm. He was willing to share his story. So the same way she nurtured her garden is the same way she took care of her seed, her son. Exactly, literally. And I, right. And, I mean, that has so much power and impact. And when you talk about the weight of the mission, what is the exact mission of UNCF? Well, you, first of all, UNCF is a, the nation's largest and most effective minority education assistance organization. Um, there's a fact that we as an organization do not do, we don't, we don't toot our own horn enough, okay. in my opinion. Wait a um, minute. <laughs> I had to ring the bell. All right, go ahead and hit it one time, Patrice. <laughs> so, 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 Yes. We all know how big that is. Right. When you, you move that to the side, in our category, in, in, alone, UNCF overall as an organization has maybe 200, a little over 200 employees. Okay. We know how. We That's know, a relatively small organization. Exactly. Right. We're 75 years old. Okay. And this year, we're 75 years old. We're $5 billion into this thing. So when you compare that That's to the U.S. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. When you compare, That's another bell yeah. ringer. Okay. So when you compare it to the United States government, we are number two to the government in providing assistance, financial assistance to minorities. With a staff of 200 or less. Exactly. And not all staff are fundraisers. Awesome. So, you know, we have people who manage the programs that the students end up uh, getting scholarships through. But when you think about that. To be this small, we're like not even a, a, a mustard seed size compared to the government. Right. But the impact, we're standing shoulder to shoulder with the government in providing financial assistance to minority students. And for me, that's something I wear proud. You know, I wear it proudly. I talk, And I'm like, why don't we talk about this often enough? But when you put it in perspective, then you understand how much of a legend UNCF is. You know, we're a living legend. And we have many people wanting to do what we do, but none are able to duplicate exactly what we do. And so what part of our, our what, well, the number one goal, the number one thing we have to do is uh, provide assistance, which is part of my job, raising the funds. Um, I'm one of, I think we're at 20, 22 offices. Okay. And uh, we have to raise uh, the unrestricted funds to support our 37 membered institutions. And they are historically black colleges and universities. They are private institutions. They are There are currently over, I think it's 101 accredited HBCUs currently. And 37 of those belong to UNCF. Um, when Dr. Patterson, Frederick Patterson, and Miss Mary 
uh, McLeod Bethune decided, you know, 1944, that they would go ahead and sit down and figure out how we can assist the students who couldn't tr- attend the traditional PWIs or primarily uh, white institutions. So UNCF came, became an organization because of that. And to be able to say, we have 37 schools that I help stay open. That's, That's remarkable. That is remarkable. Because I'm, I'm, I'm here in Michigan, and it, the impact is phenomenal. And it's, you know, yes, we, we know there's no UNCF school here. However, there are plenty of UNCF scholarship recipients here that, live in the, yes. that are from here. There are, are a ton of them he, from here. And so what I do matters. So to know that the Russ Colleges are getting assistance because, oh, I was able to, to, to meet my financial goal, that gives me peace. You know, because it's one of the schools that many students don't know about. Right. You know, it's smaller, so it gets lost in a shuffle sometimes. But we all know about the Morehouses. We know about the Clark Atlantas and the Spellmans and the Xaviers. We know about those schools. But what I do help them, too, as well. So it's, it's, it's a, a heavy load. However, you know, when you have the right people in place, we were able to carry it. Sound like you wanted to say when you have a remnant. That's what <laughs> I mean. sound like that's what you wanted to say. Just in but the church. Yeah, when you, when you definitely. And so, like, just recalculating what you were saying, over this 75 years, you all have been able to raise $5 billion in scholarship. $5 billion with the B. Five billion with the B. With the B. And uh, your work specifically helps 37 out of those 101 mm-hmm. accredited uh, HBCUs. So first, let me shout out to all the HBCUs that are out there, all of the HBCU grads. Yeah. Shout out all of the Divine Nine, uh, <laughs> you know, fraternities and sororities. And uh, for those who are listening, uh, we'll plug this here as well. But if they were looking to help or assist in any way, uh, where could they contact you or how can they get in touch with you if they would like to provide donations? It's very simple. Uh, you can go to uncf.org slash Detroit. Okay. And you will see that's the local mini site. And you can uh, click on the donate button and donate that way. Uh, you can also call the office. You can mail me a check. All right. Go ahead. Give <laughs> to, me the address. To, you, you can mail the check to New Center 1. And we're at th- that's 3031 West Grand Boulevard, Suite 531. Detroit, Michigan, 48202. Just say, attention, Patrice Neal. Okay. So it's, it's just it's, that simple. That simple. It's, it's just really that, that simple. simple. Yeah. So those who are listening, we compel you to allow the weight of this mission to follow you home today yeah. and to help out because now we're going to talk about what's something that I find uh, the topic for tonight is education, the great equalizer. Because even in this day and age, we have several students, several scholars that are now first generation college students. Let's talk about that. You know, so it, it is the great equalizer, my opinion. There are facts to prove it. There um, is a, a report that UNCF did personally, recently released. It's called HBCUs Punching Above Their Weight. It's okay. on the uncf.org uh, site, so anyone can download it. And it speaks to specific statistics about the impact of an education. Um, and it gives you the, the, and I'm not the statistics ex- expert, so don't get me wrong. However, that report is very clear on the impact of education, specifically with minorities, specifically with HBCUs. Um, it is so important. I had a conversation with someone today who is um, a baby boomer. Okay. And did not finish college. And I felt so proud because she shared with me that she's made up her mind because of the impact of UNCF in her life uh, in a short time that she's going to go back to school. Excellent. And she, she, you know, and so for me, literally, it was I, I wanted to jump up and hug her because education to me, if you don't have an education, be it you go to trade school, be it you decide you're going to, you know, uh, just study and take a certificate or a class or whatever. I think education, it is a key to unlock so many doors. And it's not just, again, about a job. Uh, going to college, if that's your choice, two-year, four-year, it should be because it's a choice and not because you think you're going to get this big check at the end of the day. Absolutely. Um, my opinion. Um, I think when we... And we do a disservice to our students, our children, when we feed them the only option of going to college instead of feeding them the solution of an education. And so when you feed them that 
I think it changes their perspective because you say to a high schooler, you got to go to college. You got to go. You have to go to college. You have to go to college. You got to get a degree. Then they think I got to be in school another four years instead of showing them the importance and the impact of an education and being able to stand in rooms and have a conversation about any and everything because you have a quality education. And so for me, it shifts everything in life when you you take the time to obtain in higher education. It does, like I said, it could be a two year, four year. Yes, we have four year institutions, but what I've learned in the 20 years, not every child should go to college. Okay. Because either they're not ready, um, they're doing it because that's what they were told they had to do. And you think about that student. If I decide I'm going to make my child go to college because that's what we do in my family. Right. And that child says, okay, we all know more than likely there's going to be some student loans, a lot of them. A lot of them. So now you've sent this child to college who really does not want to be there. Now you are incurring debt. The likelihood of that child deciding I'm going to graduate is pretty slim. Pretty slim. So now you have a dropout with college, student loan, debt, Debt. and the chances of finding a job, now we're talking about a job, that can help you afford to pay that debt off, now you've you've, you've put them in a no-win situation. And so I I really implore parents to have a conversation about education um, and lay all the options on the table because there are many. And let that, that student child discover what it is that they really want to do. I didn't have a ga- know what a gap year was when I was growing up. Oh, there was no such it, thing it, as a so gap year growing up. I'm hearing up. all this about <laughs> gap years, and I was like, right. wow. That wasn't a you know, My mom wasn't having no, a gap yeah, year. No, there was no option. Right. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, if you take the gap year, take it. But use it for what it's intended for, for you to evaluate and assess. Because, you know, I, I think his, 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 back in the day, Dr. Phil said. All right. What, what did he say? <laughs> that... <laughs> We, our brains don't mature to understand consequence until we're about 25. Mm. This was years ago. Okay. My talk show days when I used to, Sit back probably had three it. months I decided to Those take three off. Three months, okay. <laughs> but I remember that, and that stuck with me because mm. we tend to, we create our children to be who we want until they get to a certain age of maturity, and then we start to discover as individuals who we are. And then you realize, I really don't like those lima beans. Yeah. I ate them because my mama told me to. And so you start to grow into who you are. And I think that lines up with education, with mm-hmm. college. You, this generation of, of, of students coming up, <laughs> it's different. It's real different. They're opting to make apps and become millionaires. Right. Now go to college. So I think the conversation of education must be had and not the conversation of college be had. And it will change how students, how, ch- how children become students or if they become students in a college classroom. So, you know, I think for me, it's have the conversation about education and shift that thought pattern in your, in your child, and it'll cause them to want to go to college. You know, I, I say all the time when you, you develop relationships in this business of fundraising, you don't have to ask for the money because you have the relationship. People will donate to you. They will. You know, yeah. and, and, and it's the same thing with talking to your child about education versus college. So I like that because I think our central goal should be to produce lifelong learners. And when mm-hmm. you present, as you said, education is a viable solution and not just as the means to acquire a job mm-hmm. that comes along with a certain salary. Mm-hmm. But you actually challenge your child to cultivate their natural giftings, their abilities, yeah. what they're good at. And if this two year or four year institution as a program that will begin to continue to cultivate their personality, provide experiences mm-hmm. that you know increase their learning, their skills, their knowledge, their ability, and then the result of that particular solution or acquiring that education mm-hmm. equals this, you know, uh, opportunity to make an impact. Yeah. Then you know the finances will come because how many people do we know that worked certain jobs because and that's what they went after. And then they realize mid-career, mm-hmm. hey, this is not what I exactly. want to be doing. And so they have a degree. I don't know what the statistic is now, but of how many people are actually, their job has nothing to do, absolutely, absolutely nothing to do with the degree that they earned. 
but they use those transferable skills. Mm-hmm. So when you talk about education as a viable solution, when you talk about uh, what I love what you said is when you develop the relationship, then that exchange that needs mm-hmm. to occur, it, it almost becomes organic because that relationship, the need is there mm-hmm. and then the ability is there, but the relationship is what connects the two. I saw a post today on Facebook. It was hilarious. It was saying how many people, uh, you know, you don't hear from them for a long time. And then when it's time for their event or it's time for them to do something, they're, you know, hitting you up. They don't even say, mm-hmm. hello, how are you? They immediately post whatever it is. And then they're asking for you to participate, not concerned about you, the individual, but wanting your support. Exactly. You know, and, and that happens a lot in fundraising. Um, there's a, a, a term that I won't, I won't use here. However, um, they liken it to dating. Okay. Um, and so, uh, okay. And so <laughs> um, I don't personally like the term, but in a lot of ways it's true. Right. Uh, you know, we have our fiscal year is from April 1st to March 31st every year. Okay. And so within that time frame, my goal has to be met financially. Uh, and so if the only time I am in your face is when I ask you for your donation, then we have a problem. Absolutely. Um, no one wants to feel like they're only around because of their check. And so for me, it's about relationship building. And when you build a relationship with your community stakeholders, you build trust. And so when they see that you're always talking about your mission and you're never asking for the money from them, it, it compels them to write the check. And I'm a, I, I've witnessed it over, over the years. And so I've witnessed it lately. Um, and so to have relationships with your donors is so vital. It's important. It's, you can't get around it. Otherwise, you will constantly see the decline in your finances and as against your goal. You'll start to see your volunteers disappear. That's right. You'll, you'll look up and the walk is no longer 1,100 people, but it's more like 300. Mm-hmm. Um, and so those, those are, are indicators of you don't have relationships anymore. You've, you've lost your, your way. And so, again, back to ministry. And so for me, it's all connecting. It's, it's, we have to have relationships. I have to send you a report on what I, how I spent your money. I have to tell you what we're doing and not always waiting for an opportunity to come knock on your door and say, you know, can you write me another check? So, it, you know, you, you have to build those relationships. Did you know, and this is what I love about the millennial generation, so I happen to, you know, I fall in that millennial generation. I'm one of the older millennials. <laughs> but it is statistically shown that millennials are more attached to mission than they are the appearance of impact. Mm-hmm. So they want to know exactly, like, okay, what are we doing? What is it going to? Uh, how does this disrupt the the normative standards? How mm-hmm. are we, you know, breaking ground on something new? How are we innovating so millennials are attached to mission. And that's what I love about what you're saying here is that when you can demonstrate and show impact, like this is what your dollars are going to. These are the lives that you are changing, like the young man you brought up. Mm-hmm. And then myself personally, uh, a young lady at my church, uh, she will be, she's a grad, she's going to be, she's a senior this year mm-hmm. uh, down at Talladega College. Woo-woo! Shout out, shout yeah. out. Um, she is or I don't know how the process goes, but she's Miss UNCF Mm -hmm. down at Talladega College. And just to see the pictures and hear about her experience and how she's engaging with education and how she's just, I mean, she's excelling in everything Mm -hmm. that she's doing. And for UNCF to have a play a part or a role in her life as she matriculates and move forward, like, you know, hats off to you guys. And uh, keep going, Jameer. I know you're going to do (laughs) great things. Uh, super excited about the life that she's building. And uh, we all know it's the grace of God that affords us that opportunity. Mm. And he connects us through relationship right. with organizations like UNCF that's able to fund and fuel our mission. Yeah. yeah. And so you talk about impact. Um, yes, our primary focus is our 37 member institutions. However, UNCF administers over 400 programs, scholarships and programs. 
in the, in the 75 years, we've assisted close to half a million students get to and through college. Okay. Um, so, you know, the, the, the one thing used to be, the thing used to be get them in school, get them in school. We got to get them through it because right. a lot of students, again, the debt, you get in and you don't finish, you got debt. You, the government is not waiving that situation by no means. So we, our mission is to get them there and to get them out of there with a degree in hand. Um, we also have advocacy that we do from our national office um, that has great impact. That's a K to, through 12 situation. Okay. So we get them beforehand. And, you know, so there are tons of things that UNCF does. The impact here in Michigan. Tell me more about that program, the K through 12 program. So advocacy is something that we have. Sekou Biddle, he's over our advocacy in D.C. Uh, we're working to get that going here is very successful in Indianapolis okay. in that market um, and it's something that reaches out to the students who are in a situation like DPS students okay and so we we form a relationship with DPS that's the goal hopefully we get it done okay and get in there and develop those students so that we can get them over to the college space it's needed it's desperately it's grossly needed, needed um, because our scholars are some of them, two to three grade levels behind, mm -hmm. and it's not a shortage of opportunity. And that I think as an educator, and everybody that's listening that's in education could attest to this, is that even though they may move on to the next grade, if you know that you haven't shortened the distance between uh, their deficit of knowledge in a substantial way, even though they go from eighth grade to high school, mm -hmm. like you can affirm and know that they are not prepared yeah. for that level and they only have four years to truly exactly. engage with the information because here's the thing like the standards don't change just because there's a deficit That's right and so we need to uh it's that collective uh, model where we use all of the stakeholders and do me a favor patrice who identify who are the stakeholders for uncf uncf well you know we have our foundation community here okay. in michigan who are consistently and constantly supporting UNCF. Of course, we have, of course we have our corporate um, uh, partners. We have our wonderful volunteers who are die hard. Uh, they're going to be there no matter what, which again, at the walk, you see them out there at the crack of dawn when there's no light. Right. And so because they believe in the mission, um, we have what is the Detroit Inter-Alumni Council. They are a volunteer group made up of alum from our HBCUs. And then there are some who are from other HBCUs, non-UNCF schools, and there are some who are from traditional schools. But they believe in UNCF so much that mm -hmm. they're at the table trying to figure out how we can help raise money. How, how can we participate in that? How do we become a part of that? All you have to do, the, the current president for the Detroit Inter Alumni Council is Curtis Kilpatrick. Okay. And so he is a Morehouse grad. All right. And uh, so you can call the office and let us know, and I can connect you to Curtis and the IAC and they can make sure that you can become a member sit at the table with them and have conversations they're the ones sponsoring the college fair piece at the walk and so to have conversations about how you can join in and work with them uh, on the initiatives for UNCF they are the face of you the, the schools they went to the schools and so they understand the need um, and they get and they understand the quality of education you'll receive as well so those are the stakeholders, they are at the table all the time. I have one volunteer no matter what. She's going to come in. She's going to straighten my life up. She'll, okay. She's like, it, it, you got to have an office that look like people uh, work here that are professional she, without ever asking. But she wants to put her hands to work. And so if it means coming in and stacking papers neatly, she'll come in and do that for two hours. If it means she'll come and organize the, the uh, brochures so when someone does come in, it's neat, she'll do that. Um, so we have people who give back in many ways, and she writes checks. <laughs> so all of that's well. You so know? you know, but again, those are our stakeholders. Those are the people who, who believe in what we do. And again, it's relationship. That's you know, good. it's relationship. I love how it has that bifurcated piece where mm -hmm. you can come and volunteer your presence, and also if you want to volunteer, if you want to volunteer or give monetarily, like that, both of those are welcome. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, it's one of those things where sometimes where people may not be able to financially give, but they can give of their time and their exactly. talents. Or if somebody says, you know, my schedule is a little packed mm -hmm. and they're able to, you know, give of their treasure, their time, their talent, you know, their treasure, mm -hmm. they're able to give of in that way as well. So literally there are no barriers to engagement. No. In any way, shape, form, or fashion. What, what are some of the, because I think sometimes when people, 
consider themselves, and we talk about community stakeholders, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we break down, we identify that that's the parents, that's, you know, the schools, that's our corporate sponsors, uh, that's our, our scholars. In what way does UNCF incorporate scholar voice? Well, we use, uh, I don't like the word use, I like to engage uh, past recipients, um, current students, by having them tell their story, just as you did about the young lady at your church. That provides such a real-time impact to okay. that potential donor or to that current donor who's sitting there and saying, hmm, if, if I gave, what would it do? You know, how what's my return on investment? Uh, a few years ago, we had... Um, a, we had decided we would do this, I am your, your dividend. And so because you're investing in better futures, you're investing right. in these, these lives and the education of a student. So you have to wonder, okay, well, if I give this scholarship, how does that benefit me? So when you use a scholar, when you use a student who has been through it, who received from it, or who's going through it, and they tell their story, it's amazing to me. And it's not that we pick the, the, the saddest story to use, but the, there's a common denominator in the stories, and that is that they're underrepresented, and that is that they come from low-income families. And so UNCF has been a, a lifesaver for them because otherwise they couldn't get to a college because they couldn't afford it. So, you know, we, we like to have them tell their own story. And often we call upon them and they're there and they're like, OK, well, who do I need to tell? Thank you. Right. Um, which is hard to get a lot of younger people to do to say thank you. <laughs> to right. say thank you. Um, right. But we get them to come back and talk. And just sometimes it's just for no other reason than to say, I'm a dividend. Your investment yielded me. This is this is what you pay, you, you didn't pay for, but this is what you invested in. Right. And you know, we there's a, a video that was done by um, General Motors, G-Man, and it's on. Uh, I put it on my social media, but it was for th the impact mm -hmm. of they used two of their employees who were impacted by UNCF, and so to go to those great lengths to share their story. General Motors is global. So to share that story speaks volumes about that scholar who was impacted. I had someone who uh, remembered UNCF giving her a scholarship, and she paid it forward by giving back what she received. And so mm -hmm. those, again, are relationships and emotions and, and gratefulness and just saying, you know what, I'm going to keep this organization going because it made a difference in my life. And the times we're in now, we got to keep helping. We have to do more for sure. I agree. So you're talking about someone has the potential to have a global impact by sowing a seed mm -hmm. or by giving or donating to the organization mm -hmm. because it's very difficult to not be compelled when your ROI is looking you in the eye. That's right. And they're shaking your hand and they're telling you, thank you. Thank you. Like gratitude is extremely important mm -hmm. in the line of work uh, as far as development and fundraising because people, they want to see that. They want mm -hmm. to see in some way how their hard earned, you know, finance or work is translating in somebody else's life. And so in Michigan, yeah, it's, again, because I get the question, and I started this, this thought a few minutes ago, but we, I'm always asked, how does it impact Michigan? UNCF, there's no UNCF school here. I don't know anybody who got a UNCF scholarship. Why should I give? I've, I've had a few of those calls lately. Um, but in academic year 17, 18, in Michigan. Okay. There were over 160 students who received over $2 million in scholarships through UNCF in, in Michigan. Michigan. Okay. In Michigan. 160 students. Oh, it was a matter of fact, it was 163. 163 students. 2.2 million. In Michigan. In Michigan. 17, 18 school year. Yes. 2.2 million. Correct. Okay. So that is the investment and the impact that's being made right here in Michigan through UNCF without an HBCU here. And so, you know, it's, it's very important to understand that there is a far reach, you know. And so you, you don't think about, um, they're like, well, I, no one's ever received a UNCF scholarship that I've talked to. And, and I, I like to debunk myths. Let's do it. So this is a myth. A UNCF scholarship doesn't exist. There is not a UNCF scholarship. UNCF administers scholarship programs. 
So you will see scholarships named after Andre. Okay. You will see scholarships named after Patrice that UNCF administers. That's what you'll see. So I, I've had to, I had a nice conversation with someone who's an executive somewhere. And she was like, well, I'm doing this because my company told me I had to. And I've never heard of anyone who got a scholarship, a UNCF scholarship. And I laughed. And she said, well, I'm not sure what's funny. I said, because you're right. You don't know of anyone because no one exists. And she really, she, she said, okay, oh, wait, wait a minute. And so when I explained to her the difference, right. and this is just about, it's not semantics, it's really about facts. There is not a UNCF scholarship. You can't search my website and find UNCF scholarship. You can search it, and you can definitely find that there is a McGregor Fund scholarship for Detroit students. You can definitely go in there, and you can find that there is a DTE Energy Scholarship for students from, from parts of Michigan. You can find that. And it's all through UNCF. UNCF is kind of like a library. Okay. We're, we're providing resources. We're, you know, you go in the library, you look for a book on gardening, there it is. Right. The library didn't write the book, but it's there. And so it's the same thing with UNCF. We're not funding this, this sp specific scholarship. We're administering the program that's funded by a donor. And so when people hear that, it kind of shifts their perspective. And then they're saying, oh, so go back, talk to your friend, and say, well, what scholarship did you get? And you'll see, more than likely, especially at an HBCU, UNCF or otherwise, you're going to find that they did get assistance from UNCF because we provide scholarships through a lot of colleges, HBCU and non-HBCU. And so it's because we administer several programs. Now, you know, a lot of people, especially when you talk about scholarship dollars, well, they're just looking to see to make sure that balance has been reduced. You know, I mean, right. let's, let's be honest. It's That's like, true. It's like okay, you get your uh, you get your your uh, your receipt or your spread about you know mm -hmm. what's old that year, and it, it has a detail on mm -hmm. you know who, what scholarship has come. Mm -hmm. And but so the they're main, not looking yeah, at the, the main name. thing you're looking for is like does it say <laughs> zero? zero? Does it say zero? <laughs> or is my room and board left on here? Let me make right. sure. Oh lord, yeah, I still have to buy these five hundred dollars, mm -hmm. six hundred dollar books. Yeah, uh, but. And so a lot of times it is important for us to pause for a minute and understand, because you guys administer in liaise, you know, between where the need is and then those who are able to donate. Correct. So now let's talk about we got it. We have it coming up. All right. It is coming up this August 24th, Saturday. Woo -woo. Woo -woo. Hit the bell. All right. <laughs> yes. August 24th. Yes. Uh, the 2019 Walk for Education. 31 years in. 31 years in. Yes. And on, I've been around for over 20 of them. Watch out. On the beautiful <laughs> Bella. Yes. Okay. Talk to me. Walk me through that day. If somebody wants to volunteer, what's needed? What's happening? What's going well, on? Well, we always need we, we, the grunt work, I like to call it. Um, we, we we have the, the alphas who live, do the hair. Yeah. Hold on. Wait a second. Go let's, ahead. let's pause there for a minute. <laughs> Throw it up one time. Yeah. 06 to the good brothers. <laughs> Ice cold. Please believe it. Detroit <laughs> chapter, celebrating our centennial. Had to get it in. I, I knew he would. Yes. Uh, so <laughs> the wonderful alphas, they come and they do a lot of grunt work. You've been out there. Yes. So a lot of grunt work, the grunt work of setting up the tables and 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 pour, uh, uh, transporting the ice in the big old bucket. Transporting the what? The ice. The ice. Yeah. Nothing, to, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I walked in. Right, yeah, right. Yeah. You know, and, and, and taking care of things like that, manage, manning the parking lot. So things like that, we no one ever wants to set up and break down. And so those are things we always need help in. It moves the whole process faster. Um, we have wonderful corporate sponsors. We have... Um, uh, we have Delta Airlines who are presenting sponsor. We have uh, General Motors and UAW Ford and Ford Motor Company, our wonderful sponsors, our presenting sponsors. And so they come, they, they make this a little bit easier for me. Okay. You know, I am one of a very large staff of Mi in Michigan. Yes. Drum roll, please. Drum roll. I am one of two people. <laughs> one of two. <laughs> for the entire state of Michigan. Wow. So when I have my volunteer arms, I like to call them, they're the extensions. Yes. And they go out and they come in the form of sponsors. And they come in the form of, and I have to give shouts out to all of my sponsors, um, to the Comerica Bank, to Hinkle Corporation, um, to AAA Mich of Michigan, to uh, or the Auto Club Group, to Meritor. We have Bridgewater. Um, and if I forget someone, I might be in trouble. So let, let's um, take 
Um, Look, let's make sure. <laughs> so we have <laughs> we have quite a few sponsors who are always willing to say yes. We endorse this. We believe in this, and because of that, you know. We're going to write the check, but we're going to show up, too. We, you know, a lot of our teams, because you, the Detroit walk in UNCF right. is the absolute largest okay. walk within UNCF's or uh, network. And Shout we out to Detroit. Has been the for largest in the nation. Going on year nine. Year and nine. And so we wear that proudly. Yes. And I'm constantly asked how. We have a, a financial goal of 750000 okay. for the walk by itself. Um, and we continue to reach towards that million dollar mark. We're gonna get there eventually. Absolutely. Um, and so it's be, the reason we're able to do it almost effortlessly is because UNCF is a charity of choice for a lot of people. Okay. And so it makes it easier. Um, so when I don't have to stand up and convince you to believe in me because your coworker is telling you, man, you got to do this. Right. And this is why. And then that one tells another one. And so it makes this easier. It makes the message easier to, to share. And because of that, the walk has become so successful. It's a wonderful outreach uh, component of what UNCF does, which uh, since I'm saying that, the college fair part, um, which is sponsored by the Detroit Inter-Alumni Council. And we're doing something that I'm personally proud of. This year, that's never been done. Okay. We now this 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 is this is huge. Listen in, a, lean a, in. It's a big deal. Lean in. It's a big deal for all of you parents who have high school students who have seniors, especially. Right. Um. You come to the walk Saturday, August twenty fourth. Okay. Uh, we start at eight o'clock. There will be a college fair tent that will have currently about almost twenty schools represented. However, the, the key is, is that you need to get them there because there is an opportunity for your high school seniors to apply to. Okay. Drum, Drum roll, please. Not one. Not one. HBCU. All right. Not 10. Not 10. Not even 30. Not 30. But they have the opportunity to apply to up to 54 HBCUs at one time. At one time. This is the key Here's word. Here's the key. Here's the operative word. Major key. Lean in. Lean in. It's for free. For free. You tell me I can apply to 54 HBCUs on August 24th, go under the college tent. Yes. My high school senior. Yes. And I can apply to these colleges for free. For free. For free. On site. So the $35 college application fee. Per Per school. college. Per yes. school. That I would normally have to pay. I can apply to 54 schools yes. for free. For free. So the application fee is no longer an excuse. It's not an excuse. And not only is that not an excuse, Okay. Uh, there is a $25 registration fee, pre-registration fee to participate in the walk. But if you are coming as a student okay. who has a parent that says, this is my senior and I want them to apply, I'm coming yes. for the college fair, you don't have to pay the registration fee. So I can come to the walk yes. for free yes, and apply to these 54 colleges for, for free. free. Yes. Okay. So literally the only thing I have to do is get there. Get there. Bring your friends. Get there. Get Be there. Because, again, like I told the story about the young man and his mother grew a garden because that's how they were able to eat. Um, there's a lot of people who that $35 is gas for the week. Absolutely. It's the, 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 the money that will determine if their electricity stays on. That's right. You know, and these are realities. Yes. And so to say to me, I am not going to college, and my question will be why. It's because I can't afford to apply. There are many schools I want to apply to, but at $35 to $50 a pop, we can't afford it. Well, here's your opportunity. Right. My goal is to remove barriers so that these students and and it's not just Detroit, it's the entire state of Michigan. If you can get to Belle Isle, come. Come to Belle Isle, take advantage of an opportunity given to you for your future. It's you can choose which schools. You, you can apply to all 54. I, I would say just apply to all 54. If that's what you want to do. That's what I would encourage. Um, it's free. It's free. And, and I, I just really feel strongly about, again, removing barriers and removing that, that cost. You know, and my vice president is probably listening. Listening, He just left Detroit, and he's probably screaming at me right now when I say this. But 
that $25 registration fee is not going to determine whether or not I make a break, whether I make goal or not. Okay. It's just not, not from that student. It's right. not. And so if that means that I've now helped several underrepresented, underprivileged students apply to college, colleges, and they get in, I'm, I'm good. I work a little harder for the extra $25 somewhere else. Yes. But it's the impact. It's the messaging. It's giving hope to a lot of students who I hear. I, I'm only applying to one school, and if I don't get in, I'm not going. Well, why? why? I can't afford it. Right. I cannot afford it. I would, but. I would, but. So I'm giving you the I am. And so come out, apply, and have a chance to talk to some of the schools that will be represented on that application. And and. Get your questions answers. Parents, bring your bring your child and have them come out. You can come out if you're in ninth grade. You can come out if you're in tenth grade. Though you're not applying, you can still come out and inquire because senior year is the wrong time to decide you want to go to college and which one. Right. It's something you need to investigate and research. And so you need to bring your child. Have them come out. I know it's summer. Schools For some schools, they're back in already. Schools are already started for some. Bring them out. Bring and, them out. And here's the thing, parents, parents that are listening in, your child getting to college is not singularly their responsibility. That's right. And so don't say you were waiting for your child to come to you and say, well, mom, I talked to the counselor at school and mm -hmm. you, I've heard tons of parents say, uh, well, I'm waiting for the counselor to get back with me. Mm. Well, you have an opportunity where representative for close to over 20 HBCUs will actually be in attendance on August 24th That's right. at Belle Isle. At Belle Isle. And you have the opportunity to expose your child for free to apply to 54 colleges. Yes. But it gets better. You have the opportunity to place your child, you and your child, in an environment where corporate sponsors, mm -hmm. where uh, some of your highest level executives mm -hmm. and professionals will be on the grounds having conversations, supporting the mission of UNCF. Uh, of course, the Ice Cold Brothers of Alpha Phi Alpha <laughs> will be there. And, of course, all of the other you know organizations will be out there that are consummate professionals in their own right. Uh, but I also, here's now, so now I get to put out a challenge, right? So I challenge uh, the Run Club. We run 313. They're making all type of news, international, national news out there. They're a great Run Club. Uh, brother Lance Woods, who is an alpha, and uh, I can't think of the other brother's name, uh, but two brothers decided, one from the east, one from the west, mm -hmm. they decided to come together and start running. And now it has just created so much traction. The only reason I, I haven't been there because they, they run on Tuesdays and run on Thursdays. Right, so on mm -hmm. Tuesdays, it's two-mile Tuesdays. I think I can get a two-mile in, but it's during, <laughs> but it's but it's during the same time that we have the show. And on Thursdays, it's a 5K, 10K. I don't think I'm there yet, <laughs> but I got to work on it. So here's the challenge. I want to put it out to uh, We Run 313. We'd love for you all, because if I have an individual group that I want to create mm -hmm. and we raise funds together, we can do that as well. You can do that. You can go to the uncf.org slash Detroit Walk. Okay. And you can register, and you can form your team, and you can you get to see who you're competing against. Okay, great. So to all of the Divine Nine, make sure you get your, your walk-run groups together. Because there is a Greek trophy to be taken. Okay, there's a – well – <laughs> okay. Anyway, there's a Greek trophy to be taken. And to all of the corporate sponsors, to all of the individual teams out there, get your team together, uh, put it together, because it's all for a great cause. Mm -hmm. And again, Patrice, in these last couple minutes, uh, give them uh, where they can register, what needs to be done, and how we move forward. Like I said, you can go to uncf.org slash Detroit Walk and register for the walk, which is next Saturday, August 24th at Belle Isle. Um, f go ahead, form a team. Send out that challenge. There's still some of them on Divine Nine missing on that uh, that sheet of teams if you look on the website. So we need them <laughs> to go ahead and take that, that trophy. Uh, there's also, like I said, we have the college fair. So if you have questions, you can call the office. If you want to volunteer, you can call the office, 313-873-1500. Absolutely. And as I always say at the drawing board, your future is not behind you. It is not before you. It is within you. And I, I used to hear Tom Joyner say this all the time, but he would always say at UNCF, a mind is a terrible thing 
to waste. Make sure you come out August 24th, uh, Saturday, Bell Isle, supporting the 2019 Walk for Education. Patrice, thank you so much again thank you. for being my guest. And I look forward to being out there on the 24th. And I'll I probably put my headband on <laughs> and some sweat gear. But God bless you all, and I look forward to seeing you next week.